Kia ora, good evening everyone. My name is Laura McGoldrick and I am honestly really delighted to be here this evening as one of your MCs for the very first Get Started in Parasport online event with ACC and Paralympics New Zealand. Now I've worked in radio and tele television for about 10 years now, mainly in sport and I have to say I, I just, I adore sport. I think it's fantastic. I love the way sport can bring people together and Parasport is definitely no exception. Kia ora, my name is Dan Buckingham and my background for being here is I am Paralympian number 142. So I was part of the gold medal winning wheelchair rugby team, the Wheel Blacks, at the Athens 2004 Paralympic Games back All in right, the glory so days. Alright, so you've already outdone me. <laughs> uh, I was also part of the Beijing 2018 where we didn't do so well and it's, it's been dark days since but great to see the Wheel Blacks lining up for Tokyo 2020. Uh, I think... Uh, I guess big big difference now. My my main day is uh, filled with work, CEO of Attitude Pictures, but also I'm a dad. It's a big change of pace for me. Well, you've outdone me twice because I forgot to mention my children, so <laughs> that's a little bit of a problem. Now, Paralympics New, Ze Paralympics New Zealand, in partnership with ACC, has previously organised annual open days uh, where people from around the country can get together, come and have a go at Parasport. But because of, obviously, the uncertainty with COVID, it's mean that we've gone online, we've taken it virtual. So that is actually great for you guys at home. It means you can, you know, put the kettle on, have your dinner while you're watching what will be a great night. So over the next course of the next two days, we will bring you some phenomenal people, a lot of experts in their field, uh, everything from mental wellness to how to be classified in sport through to how to just even get involved at the grassroots. So before we kick off the good stuff that Dan was just talking about, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. Now, I'm going to read this for you because I don't want to get this wrong. As it is a virtual event, I have to say this is my first one of these virtual events as, as well. Is this your first one, Dan? It is. Mm -hmm. It's going very well so far. So let me just read it to you. So because it is an online event, we could maybe come across a few technical issues. Um, so if you are experiencing technical issues with your live stream, which you can't seem to fix, feel free to contact the team at the contact details. Uh, go uh, to the page below and someone will try their very best to help you. If worse was to happen and the website went down, it went kaput, make sure you head to the Paralympics New Zealand Facebook page and you will find a link to the live stream there. A couple of other things that will help is there is a full schedule on the PNZ website of what's coming up over the next two days. And the other thing is we'd love to hear your questions. So you can either scan the QR code uh, below the screen with your phone and it will take you to the Q&A forum. Or you can go to the website app.slido or app.sila sli.do and enter the code hashtag parasport. There is a slight delay between putting your question up and it arriving at, at our end. So whenever a question, a question pops up, just send it on through and we'll catch it eventually. So um, don't hold back is the upshot for that. No, get those questions coming through. So this event, of course, would not be possible without the support of Paralympics New Zealand's partner, ACC. ACC works with PNZ to promote parasports in New Zealand, in New Zealand two New Zealanders, together with promoting the benefits of participation in parasport for well-being and rehabilitation following injury. It is thanks to their partnership that PNZ is able to deliver events just like this one, contributing to a one-day Transform New Zealand that is truly inclusive, where para-athletes have the opportunity to participate at all levels of sport and are equally recognised for their successes. We would also like to thank the government for their continued support of disabled sport. A fantastic announcement just coming out recently. So today we have the Minister for ACC, MSD and Disability Issues, Carmel Cipollone, to, uh, she's recorded a special message for us to see what, uh, see what her take is on it. Here's Carmel Cipollone now. Ma lolele, talofalava, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. It is my great pleasure to be part of Get Started and Parasport today. This event gives us all an opportunity to find out more about Parasport and how to get involved at any level. Sport is a great way to bring everyone, disabled and non-disabled, together and has the power to promote a more diverse, inclusive and healthier society. We want New Zealand to be a society where all people have opportunities to achieve their goals and aspirations and where there is room for everyone to thrive, including through sport and recreation. I want to acknowledge Paralympics New Zealand's important role in promoting and supporting sport among young disabled people, among them our future Paralympians. Our Paralympians, like Paralympics Athlete of the Decade, Sophie Pascoe, Alpine skiing medalist Corey Peters and swimming medalist Cameron Leslie 
are important role models and an inspiration for the next generation of New Zealand athletes. Aotearoa New Zealand's Paralympians have represented with pride, dignity and success since Kiwis first entered the Tel Aviv Paralympics in 1968. It's great to see the Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games are on track for later this year, albeit not 2020, after being delayed by the emergence of COVID-19. I want to take this opportunity to wish our Paralympians who have joined us online today the very best of luck. I also want to acknowledge Sport New Zealand's work with the Sport New Zealand Disability Plan and role it plays in improving the well-being of disabled New Zealanders by encouraging participation in sport and recreation in our communities. Aotearoa New Zealand takes pride in being a great sporting nation. Sport brings us together, disabled and non-disabled people, celebrating the diversity of our human experience. I hope you all enjoy this event and encourage you to get involved and get started in Paris sport. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, if you've seen that and you've just started watching us and you're thinking, you know what, I actually need to get some other people involved, this is a two-day event, so make sure you register to watch tomorrow or kick in now. Go to the Paralympics New Zealand website, get people around it, because it is going to be a great couple of days. We've got lots planned, and I'm very lucky. I'll get to start things off tonight. So let me do that by introducing you to Paralympian number 166, Sophie Pascoe. Sophie really is absolutely a national treasure. She is a nine-time Paralympic gold medalist. Multiple. It's this. It's about this stage when I'm interview, introducing people like Sophie that I feel like I'm way out of my depth here. Um, so let me just go back there. Nine-time Paralympic gold medalist, multiple world champion. She's won five medals, broken world records, taking her tally to 15 Paralympic medals. The success has made Sophie the most decorated New Zealand Paralympian ever. And she's a great gal on top of all that as well. Sophie Pascoe, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you guys? Oh, we're good. We are very good. Dan's putting up with me. So far, so good. It's going <laughs> all right. Now, Sophie, um, great to have you with us tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about your story, how you first got started in para-sport? Gosh, well, I was um, in the school curriculum uh doing the Learn to Swim, uh, which then I sort of found a little bit of a talent uh, in the pool at the school swimming sports, which uh, then enabled me to find uh, the, uh, back then it was called the Children's Crippled Society Games, so the CCS Games. And uh, through that, I was part of Parafit Canterbury, so I got the connection through them. Um, I competed for them against all the other Parafids uh, within New Zealand. And I was spotted by um, the late Graham Condon, uh, a previous Paralympian himself, and his mate, Rolly Crichton, who also was a Paralympian, uh, that was coaching down the other end of the pool. And Graham had mentioned to Rolly, uh, come and check this young girl out. She's got a little bit of a talent. And uh, Rolly approached my mother and myself. Um, I was eight years old as well, by the way. And he basically said, your talent could potentially represent New Zealand. So as an eight-year-old, an opportunity like that um, for a coach to come and pick me out of the pool and say, come join the swim club, uh, yeah, it all went from there. I joined the swim club the next business working day. And basically, that's how I got into um, Paris sport. And I continued to partake and uh, work with Parafit Canterbury uh, until I moved up into the Paralympics New Zealand uh, uh, phase of swimming. You've done an amazing job. It's been an incredible journey. But what kind of kid were you? Like, how easy was it for you to get into the swimming pool? What made you jump on it? Look, I think back back then, anyway, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity opportunities what there is nowadays for people with disabilities to try lots of different sports. So for me, it was uh, the the swimming or biking or running and. Uh, that's also what the um, Independence Games offered. Uh, but also at school, I wasn't really sort of trying um, the likes of netball or uh, more of the social sports because I never thought I was really good enough um, being disabled. 
but I found my talent in the pool and because I had beat my best friend in the pool who had all of her limbs, <laughs> that was really a defining moment for me to basically go, oh, I'm good at this. And when you're good at something and you are disabled, I'm going to, you know, take on that challenge to continue proving that a disability, um, you know, makes you no different to anybody else. Um, in today's society, uh, the fact that, you know, young people with disabilities have so many opportunities to try lots of new sports, uh, I think is incredible. And I, I would have loved to, you know, had that opportunity. But now, um, you know, I mean, obviously, I've, I've achieved the career I have. <laughs> Swimming's going okay. Swimming's going all right. If you could try another para sport, what would it be? Uh, look, I think probably running. I love the look of running, uh, you know, the blades now, the technology that enhances uh, the running. I think it's incredible, you know, swimming, there's no technology that enhances us other than uh, the part of a swimsuit uh, that's got it to the maximum it possibly can now. And uh, that's also what I love about swimming, the fact that, uh, you know, it is basically you and you're chasing the time uh, and you're racing against other com competitors in a, in a um, you know, with no technology basically enhancing us. But oh, I think, yeah, Paris athletics now is just, yeah, the running's phenomenal, you know, how fast those athletes go. Yeah, I, I could I could see you out there. I definitely could. <laughs> so where do you look for inspiration? When you were a young kid, and like you said, there wasn't as many obvious um, ways for you to get into the para, para sport game. Who were you looking for for inspiration or looking to for inspiration back then? So when I was eight, uh, like I said, and, and, and going to these para uh, games, well, back then, um, the CCS games, look, I didn't have anybody I looked up to because... Back then, the Paralympics wasn't exactly a, a vision or I didn't have or know many um, Paralympians to be inspired by at that time in my life to what they're now being promoted on, on TV like today. Uh, so my inspiration actually came from my family. Um, my accident when I was two and a half years of age, which is the cause of you know my left leg below the knee amputated and severe scarring with loss of muscle on my right leg, uh, that happened at home um, as a family accident involving my father. So for me, my inspiration was really drawn to make my family proud and and change the image of a young girl with a disability in, in our society into um, a new image of a world champion. So for me, my inspiration was really drawn to them. At the time, my granddad was also um, very ill with lung cancer and he was an absolute... Um, uh, a, another father figure in my life and I he asked all of the grandchildren uh, what your goals are and what you want to do when you're older and at that stage I'd already competed in the CCS games and I had said to him I'm, I'm going to win a gold medal for you at the Paralympics so I was in training by that stage and uh, I I keep my promises, so I stuck to that. So my inspiration, yeah, has been my family, and it still is today, um, to continue to make me proud. And then now it's drawn out to um, a much wider crowd, which <laughs> is obviously New Zealand and the world. <laughs> oh, you make us incredibly proud. And I love when you talk about your granddad. I've heard you speak about him before, and I love the way your face lights up. It's beautiful. Now, if you guys at home have got any questions for Soph, keep those coming in. We're going to get to that later on. We've got we've got some time set aside so that we can ask your questions to Sophie. But, Sophie, we talked about your inspiration being your family how does it feel to you now knowing that you are the inspiration to so many gosh it's very humbling actually um i've got a little bit involvement here with the paraffin canterbury and i see the development swimmers coming up uh here in particular down in christchurch uh but also obviously at nationals and you know i look at a couple of people the likes of tupo and alabin and um you know, I, I visited Ella when she was ill in hospital and back then she actually wanted to be a runner. Um, and, you know, I came in and I showed her my gold medal and the same with Tupo. She was so very young and I showed her my gold medal and now I get to stand up on the podium alongside those girls who, uh, you know, I get to compete against and that I got to inspire them. It's really humbling that I can have an impact in Paris sport uh, just by doing what I love um, every single day.
So what would you say to young up and coming para athletes? Some tips, some guides for how they, they get to be the next Sophie Pascoe. I would say absolutely get involved in sport, um, but just to have fun, but take any opportunity that is given to you. Um, you never know who's sitting on the sidelines and watching, uh, and it only takes one person to give you that opportunity uh, that will make you great and, uh, you know, that will have full trust in you. So. Uh, definitely get connected with the para feds around New Zealand. That's a really great start for para sports. Um, you know, I'm still part of para fed Canterbury today and uh, how they can enhance you into, you know, becoming a world champion. What uh, was the most important thing for you at the start of your, your para sport journey? Look, I think the most important thing is to have a passion, to have... Uh, you know, it, can't, it comes as a passion first and then it comes to setting goals. And I think setting goals are really important. You know, those are in my daily life, let alone obviously a four-year cycle. Um, so, you know, you've got to have the passion to be able to put in the work ethic and then you've got to set the goals to be able to, you know, keep you to that work ethic. So absolutely those two things I think are really vital. But also... Um, you know, with, you know, setting the goals and having the passion, you've got to have a great support team around you to be able to help you get there. Yep, absolutely, you do. Now, we're going to take some questions uh, that have been written in, especially for you, Sophie. Hi, Sophie. What are you looking forward to most about Tokyo? <laughs> Um, I think it's just going to be the whole experience. You know, I've been to three Paralympic Games now, each very different, um, also very different ages from being a you know young 15-year-old to now going to my fourth as a, as a 28-year-old. Uh, I think it's going to be the overall experience of a, a Games during the middle of a pandemic. I think it's going to be a really surreal experience and uh, I think also taking that in that I'm going to be part of one of the most unusual games that's going to ever be held. Yeah, people are going to talk about this one forever. Uh, another yeah. question for you, Sophie. Would you do Paris snow sports? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and look, I say that only because... Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was fearless, and and you are when you're a kid, and that's when you're at your best. Um, and I remember being up in the ski fields with uh, my other able-bodied peers from school, you know, on a skill, school field trip day uh, to the slopes. And, you know, I was coming down the slopes with them. Now I cannot ski or snowboard. And it's only because I was not allowed to do any other sport while swimming. And the reason why is because obviously swimming is the most non-contact sport ever. Um, I couldn't risk of getting injured. So now I have the fear of getting injured. So um, <laughs> I'm not so good at skiing on the slopes. It's a terrible thing when you become an adult and all of a sudden you like realise that there's like there could be consequences here if you do slide yeah. down this thing. Like this could go <laughs> bad. Uh, Sophie, another question: Would you become a swimming coach? Ooh, um, I have done a little bit of coaching um, with my own swim club and. I love watching kids grow into the swimmers and you can absolutely see a talent from such a young age. And also you can definitely see, uh, yeah, the passion and the drive within the athlete as well, whether they're committed to going the full way. However, I think, you know, I've been around swimming a long time now, 19 years. Um, that's a lot I for think... a young girl. You're a young woman. That's, that's a long time. Yeah. And I think the pool side is, you know, um, there may be a place for it later in life. But once I finish swimming, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'll probably want to see a pool for a little while. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> uh, another question: Do you think you will try para athletics once you have finished with swimming? Um, so I actually uh, recently, not long, got a a blade, and uh, as exciting as it is running, I'm you know, not a gravity athlete. So gravity and me aren't necessarily the best connection. Um, <laughs> and I'm terrible at running, but uh, I'm slowly getting there. And if anyone saw my lockdown videos, uh, which are up on my Instagram, you can see that um, it's 
absolutely horrendous for me to <laughs> even run 2k let alone you know making goals of going to um, a Paralympics so probably not in the near future oh come on so if anyone do it I'm sure you can uh <laughs> someone maybe give, I might need some tips from Liam Malone <laughs> yeah yeah you should I'm sure give him a call <laughs> you give give you pointers um now another question what do you like to do in your free time when you're not in the pool oh goodness um Look, I, like I say, I don't go out and do too much because I'm so tired uh, from all the training I do. So um, my rest days are very much revolved probably around cafe hopping and <laughs> catching up with my family and friends because, well, usually in a um, non-pandemic situation, uh, I travel a lot. So I'm spending a lot of time overseas and I don't I actually get to spend as much time with my family and friends as I'd love to. Um, at the moment, I'm in a very privileged situation where I've never spent this much time with my family and friends before. So it's it's amazing. So I don't actually get up to much. Um, I love movies. I am a big movie critic. And yeah, I love good food and good coffee. What's been your favourite movie from the pandemic, would you say? Oh, no, there's actually been a lot. Um <laughs> Yeah, Netflix has been a very good binge it has situation. Been great. Very um, good. Uh, we've got a message here saying thanks, Sophie. You're awesome. We'll be cheering for you over here. Uh, another message uh, saying, Thank would you. you enjoy doing a team para sport? Do you know what? I think I would. Um, I've spoken to a few teams um, around here in New Zealand. And, you know, whenever I get into a see a team environment or I'm part of it for a small period of time um I love how they connect with one another and I have that within my own team of what I've created with you know my wider support team and my core support team network uh but obviously it's a solo situation just you and the black line um but to be able to just relate to one another, to have that environment of so many others around you, um, I suppose, you know, even the, just the fact that head up and uh, you've got a, um, you know, scenery around you as well. But yeah, I would love to try a team sport. I'm unsure what that would be. Um, maybe maybe Dan could give me some lessons on the wheelchair rugby. Yeah, you'd be good at that. I'd yeah. recommend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah he thinks it. you'd be quite good. Kind of uh, pretty good, jump alongside Cody. <laughs> Uh, now, another question for you here. Did COVID change your training? And tell us a bit about that. Yeah, look, COVID, uh, obviously, massive impact for everybody. Um, yeah, it was pretty hard, obviously, not being able to get into a pool for 12 weeks. Uh, that's a really long time um, out of the pool in terms of when it's such a feel-based sport. So we're talking... Um, you know, 12 weeks, you times that by two, that's when you're going to get back up to fitness uh, level again. And yeah, it was really challenging. It made me realize what's really important to my life. Um, so at the time, I was really only focused on Tokyo and I didn't have anything else um, in my life at the time. So now I very much have a nice balanced life with um, a partner and, and trying to look into getting into business and also looking towards Tokyo. And I think, and that is one thing I would recommend um, if you do get into sport and it does get into um, you know, a vision of representing New Zealand, definitely keep up your studies or have something going on in the background you know you never know when sport can end or abruptly um you know put a halt to it so you must have a really good balance in your life so i think that's what covid did in terms of the actual training side yeah i don't train as much as i used to um look and that's not because i i don't need to it's we're finding different ways of training um for me now so i'm less time in the pool and more time working on my mental health, um, you know, whether that be yoga and different types of training and different environments to train in um, with cross trainings and, um, and yeah, and still keeping up with my gym. So I'm in a really good space at the moment. You sound like you're in a really good space, which is really yeah. cool. We've got a message from Carly, which sort of um, comes quite nicely off the back of that last answer there. She's asked how you manage your time. Gosh, I think everyone manages their time and, and uh, yeah, 
in their own way. It, it, it does get a little overwhelming at times. Um, I definitely prioritise um, my mental health over everything um, nowadays. And obviously, uh, once you've got that in such a great place, then you're able to take on, um, you know, the other time slots for the day, you know, where, you know, where that is. I think just making sure that it's really balanced. So for me, yes, sport was my absolute, absolute um, be all, but now it's very much, you know, um, I'm, you know, the goal is there, the drive's there. I'm absolutely, you know, committed and 100% to my goal, but making sure there is that time and space for yourself. Um, you know, if you need to take that time out, um, I very much highly um, am a firm believer that you have to take it out for for the mental health space. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, Sophie Pascoe, have you tried any other water sports apart from swimming, like, say, jet skiing? Oh, jet skiing. Uh, well, every Christmas uh, we uh, head up to the Golden Bay with our family, which has been a bit of a tradition. And uh, I water ski and wakeboard when I can. So that's when it's not Olympic years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's probably the only, and, and jet skis as well. Friends have jet skis, so we can, you know, jump onto those. So, yeah, other water sports are definitely um yeah, you know, partaking in those. And Steve wants to know how much of your time is spent on finding funding. Finding funding. Uh, look, I'm very fortunate that, um, you know, High Performance Sport New Zealand and Paralympics New Zealand support me in that area, but I also have a great management team behind me that, um, you know, I'm aligned with amazing brand partners um, who help endorse, uh, you know, my values and, and what I can give to the community as well as obviously how I can um, help them out as well. So uh, I'm in a very, very fortunate enough position that, um, you know, I have great um, backers behind me yeah fantastic do you still have fun swimming or is it really something serious <laughs> with a lot of pressure on you that's a very good question look I'm not gonna lie yes uh, I think today's uh, world it, it is pretty tough with the pressure um, and I've created that pressure myself I think one of the hardest pressures that I deal with is my own pressure uh, because of my own expectations. Um, you know, I've succeeded at three Paralympic Games, going to a fourth, um, 19 years in the sport. Yeah, the black line gets pretty pretty dull at times. You know, the black line doesn't change. <laughs> but it's, um, it's also very rewarding when you know you have put in that hard work. And uh, one moment that you... Um, that you will always remember will be that two minutes uh, standing up on the podium listening to the national anthem and and that's that's a pride and that's honor um, and that's integrity that you know people um, you know look at you winning that medal and uh, for me the medal is actually for the other people and for me uh, it's that two minutes standing up on the podium listening to the national anthem so that's what I strive for and um, but it does come with its own challenges at times with, you know, uh, uh, not every day is a great day following the black line. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine. I do. I love watching you when the anthem is playing during those Paralympics because you look like you take nothing for granted. Like it's not a given that you're going to win this gold medal. And it just you can see it on your face. It's just fantastic. It makes me so proud. I could cry just thinking about it. Um, the next question is, do you know what you want to do after Tokyo? Yes, I am currently working on that now with some amazing support um, going on behind the background uh, through my life advisor and also through a um, mentorship scholarship that I have received through Ernst & Young, um, which is a worldwide um, scholarship for women. And um, I'm focusing on uh, business. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but um, it's really exciting times as well um, like I said before having a nice balance so when I come home from the pool I get to work on um, something exciting for the future that uh, will still get to share Sophie in everyone's lives in some sort of way. I love that. Uh, Sophie Pascoe tell me about Paraswimping Championships. 
Uh, this year's uh, New Zealand Swimming Para Championships were in April. So uh, that was our qualifying event for the Paralympics. We had uh, five athletes qualify, which was um, actually all of us had been to a Paralympic Games before, uh, which was really exciting. And actually the Olympians who were qualifying, none of those athletes have been to an, an Olympic Games before. So this year's Olympic uh, Swimming Nationals were really, really I thought exciting in terms of um, seeing that new generation evolve. And um, I think the the few para athletes that didn't make this year's are certainly gonna make um, Paris in 2024. What has been your proudest moment to date? Look, my proudest moment is uh, the legacy that I that I'm, I'm creating and still continuing to, uh, but, and within that, it's really making my family proud and, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, I'm, I'm continuously changing that image um, of what a lot of everyone uh, or a lot of families have gone through um, or experienced accidents and, uh, have, you know, I don't want to be able to have that people see that image of knowing that it's a negative um, for the likes of, you know, our family and we've now, I've been able to now change that into a positive and, and be a positive impact to so many others that have gone through accidents themselves. So, uh, yeah, my proudest moment is um, changing an image of what a lot of people could class as a negative to, into a positive. Emmett would like to know what sport was like during school when you weren't in the water. <laughs> Actually, um, very competitive. I obviously have a competitive bone in my body, so I absolutely gave everything a shot, um, even down to the cross country, which oh, I dreaded, um, and came last. But I did get a McDonald's voucher for it. So, that's, um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's the only reason I competed in it. But um, <laughs> I look back at school. School was so supportive of me. I was really fortunate. Uh, to grow up in an environment that I was never bullied. Um, I was never looked or frowned upon having a disability and I was just so accepted. And that was right through high school as well. And I actually firmly and solely believe that was because I was uh, good at something else. I was good at swimming and people saw me as, you know, Sophie the swimmer, not Sophie the girl with one leg. And um, so all through school, I was, you know, I did the athletics days um, right through into high schools. I would do, do the gymnastic days. Um, I'm definitely not <laughs> as good as them as what I was back then. Like I said earlier, I was fearless. So gave absolutely everything um, a shot. Good on you. Uh, Sophie Pascoe, do you participate in surf lifesaving? No, unfortunately I don't. Um, uh, that's just solely and truly down to time. Um, I know how much time um, the surf lifesaving guys put in um, as I actually uh, get to train with a few of them alongside me in the early mornings. And um, I grew up with a lot of surf lifesavers. So, um, yeah. Tough work, but absolutely all power to them. But I do enjoy watching it. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, not me personally, but um, I enjoy watching my other peers do it. How do you deal with those more challenging days? What keeps you going and drives you to keep following that black line? Look, it's just coming back to your why, remembering why you're doing what you're doing. Um, there must be, you know, a passion for you to do it. Uh, you know, because you you got to thrive off that passion to um, obviously put in the work ethic, but then also you know whatever your why is, um, you know my my why personally is you know I'm I'm doing it to um, change that image, um, but also you know to make my family proud, to make others proud, and and to continue a legacy on that I I've I've been striving um, towards. So. Yeah, wake up in the morning, you know, when it is really tough, just just remember that why. And um, some, you know, most of the times when I get to the pool, uh, when it's been really tough in the morning, so even get out of bed or see that alarm clock go off, it's, um, I feel much better for it once I've completed the swim session and knowing that's been a contribution to um, the day I stand up behind those blocks when, it, when, the, when that day counts. Another question for you, Sophie, how do you feel about your disability? Has it changed over time? You seem more comfortable and proud with it now. 
Absolutely. I think, um, you know, society is growing. We've seen that. Um, society is changing um, with, you know, accepting. And, uh, you know, for me, it, yeah, my mindset has changed. You know, I used to wear, back in primary school, no issues. I was absolutely, you know, this young, naive, fearless kid. Um, high school, yeah, a bit challenging because obviously, um, you know, I'm starting to go through puberty. Um, I'm starting to, you know, look at boys and, you know, my other girls are around me that, um, you know, have all their limbs and yeah, I have people and social media in particular in today's society, we create this image of what the perfect person should look like. And, um, you know, there used to be a time in high school, I used to hide my leg and wear knee high socks um, because I was, not that I wasn't proud of it because I, I was very much proud of what I had achieved, but I think it was just more, I was scared to show them the real me. Um, you know, they all saw the Sophie Pascoe, the athlete, uh, but it was more the vulnerability of being Sophie. And um, there was really a turning point when I kind of got to uh a lot late a lot, lot later into my teen years um i think post london it, it might have been um but i just decided you know what let's absolutely wreck this and i got a pole league made and i very much just walk around in my pole league and i show it off and i embrace it because you know why should society choose how I should look you know you make your own look at the end of the day and um, yeah it's a tough world out there now and I very much can see that there are still days that one of my biggest fears is a full-length mirror and I look into a full-length mirror and it can be challenging and that's usually the off days when I'm not quite um, you know feeling good about myself and I know that everybody goes through that so um, it's just really about embracing you, your own body, having a disability and knowing that actually you can make an impact to somebody else who has a disability by just being you. So the perfect you is actually you. And that's how I see life now. Sophie, I just want to thank you. And I know everyone watching uh, will want to thank you as well for your honesty and for talking us through your journey. All the very best for Tokyo Girl. We'll be watching. We'll be cheering. Oh, I'm so excited for you. All things going well and we get over there. <laughs> but um, thank you again for your time. You're, you're a real legend and we are grateful to have you here with us this evening. Oh, thanks, Laura and Dan. Good See up. you, my love. Well, if that's not inspiring, Dan, I, I don't really know what is. Yeah, I love that last, uh, her response to that last question. Like, Sophie has very much always been a, a phenomenal ambassador for para sport, both, you know, as an athlete, but also outside of the pool. She She's so giving of her time and warmth, warm, but I think such an ambassador for people who live with disability generally. Uh, but it, uh, as an example, being on the other side, away from being an athlete, working in the TV industry, I got to spend some time with Sophie, 10 years ago now when she was building up to London and she was in Flagstaff, Arizona, which sounds, you know, brilliant lifestyle. You know, you're a swimmer, you're living in the States. Yeah. And I got there with the camera operator. She had been there for 10 days, I think, at that stage. She'd seen the gym, the hotel and the pool. The, her work ethic, she touched on it briefly there, but her work, work ethic is phenomenal and it always has been. Oh, and as someone who's been lucky enough to interview her, I can tell you that just the way she operates. I mean, she's a phenomenal athlete. She's also a wonderful human being. Um, so she's a great one to look at as inspiration, I think. Mm. I think the other thing that was pretty cool she touched on there was talking about the early days getting into sport and um, how important it is to always just go for it. You know, she was eight years old, but she knew there was an opportunity there, something that she could take and go further with and she she jumped it and she's made the most of it she certainly has made the most of it i mean what an extraordinary woman and what extraordinary things she's still going to do and i imagine when sophie decides she's finished swimming you just know she's going to go on to do other things uh, other wonderful things that we'll take notice of as well she's mm -hmm. got a podcast at the moment that i've been listening to she asks good questions she's clearly coming for my job which is a bit of a concern uh, <laughs> um, but no she is amazing and all the wonderful things that she said there Good stuff to be writing down. Even me, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, the perfect you is you. She's exactly mm. right. She's she's speaking a lot of truth. Yeah, just being able to centre herself as well, knowing why she's doing it. I think that was brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, we should move on. Oh, I could Plenty talk about Sophie all day. Up. Yeah, okay, we should um, probably, yeah. 
So next we are going to hear from Dale McDonald from uh, Paralympics New Zealand. So she's going to take us through the Parasport pathway from getting getting started right at the grassroots of Parasport through to how do you become a Sophie Pascoe, how do you get to the elite level. Joining her is Jane Stevens from Snowsport New Zealand as well as Michelle O from Badminton New Zealand. And they'll talk, to, talk about their respective Parasport pathways. So over to Dale. Thanks, Dale. So welcome to everyone. It's great to see so many people have registered their interest in this event and I really hope we can help you to take the next step and get you going in the para sport or sports that you're interested in, no matter the level or degree that you want to take part in that particular sport. So it's an exciting opportunity to do this online and I hope you've enjoyed everything you've seen or taken part in so far. So as you've heard, I'm Dale McDonald. I've met or been in contact with many of you before some on the phone and some via email. So surprise if you thought I was a male until this point, it's the story of my life. <laughs> so now you can put a face to the name and I'll look forward to meeting you in person sometime soon. So I work across a few different areas here at Paralympics New Zealand, including some work in the community space and also in development. Uh, previously I've worked specifically in paracycling. So during this session, we're going to talk about some of the general info around entry and pathways into different sports. And then we'll talk through a couple of examples of different sports and the para pathways that they have. So I'm going to talk through the paracycling pathway and we have a couple of special guests in Jane and Michelle to talk about para snow sports and para badminton. So we're doing a Zoom setup because we're all located in different places around the country. So hopefully it, it all works okay. Uh, we're not news readers, so bear with us. <laughs> so in terms of entry into para sports, uh, one of the ways that we help people get started in para sports is when they register their interest with us via our website. So following your registration, we would link you in with your local Parafed or D-Sport, who are usually the experts in regional sporting setups um, and have regional contacts. And if appropriate, um, the person in charge of the para aspect of the sport that you're interested in at a national level, um, and they can hopefully give you some direction regionally as well, um, and also let you know of any talent ID or competition opportunities coming up. Uh, also, we'd send you classification information if you're interested in competing in the sport, um, as well as any other relevant information or, or opportunities that we know of. So in my experience with people getting started in para sport, um, having confidence to take the first step is the biggest thing. So just making contact with a sport um, that might be new to you, but you're keen to give it a go, uh, to turn up, to meet new people and to take a risk. So I'm hoping that we can break down some of the barriers for you and fill you with confidence to take, to take that next step. So many of you are lucky enough to be a member of one of our incredible parafeds or D sports around the country and they're growing in strength by the day. Um, and as such, they remove lots of the barriers by running sports programs and giving you a chance to give different sports a go um, alongside other parafed members. So many of you have been lucky enough to be associated with the Halberg Foundation and you may have attended the Halberg Games as part of your local parafed regional team. That's another great way to try a variety of sports. Um, so I guess the moral of the story is if, is if you haven't already joined your local parafed, then I strongly recommend that you do. So I guess before we look at individual sports examples, the very first thing to understand is that every sport has quite a different pathway. Um, and for some sports in New Zealand, the para arm of their sport is quite new. Um, for others, of course, it's very developed and these are often the sports that we see winning medals at the Paralympic Games. So the majority of para sports in New Zealand operate under their individual national sporting organization or NSO. Um, and part of our role is assisting these sports with the development of the para arm of their sport. So for some sports, your introduction might be going along to a training session um, or joining in competition off the back of exposure you had through your local parafed or Halberg. Um, and for others, it might be a dedicated talent ID opportunity. So it really is, it's an exciting time for para sport in New Zealand. We're starting to take really big steps forward. We're receiving more recognition and support. Um, and in many cases, you guys are part of this movement. You're, you have a role to play in helping to develop the power arm of some of these sports, uh, especially at a club and regional level and, and leaving a legacy as a result. So not only is there a good chance 
that you'll experience connectivity and a sense of belonging as part of a sport and all the other wonderful things that sport offers. But for many people, it's also quite empowering in this whole other sense, um, which I think is really a special thing. So you're making a difference, um, paving the way, leaving a legacy, and it's, it's really powerful stuff. Um, so I'd really encourage you to embrace this side of things when the opportunity presents itself. Okay, so onto some individual sports examples now. So paracycling. Paracycling is a sport in New Zealand that's quite developed with a really strong high performance arm and an active development and talent ID program underneath that. So paracycling is one of only a few sports which is currently managed by Paralympics New Zealand. Um, however, it is in the process of integrating with Cycling New Zealand over the next year or two. <clears throat> so traditionally we've run one or two talent ID camps for paracycling each year. Um, so for people who register their interest in parasport via our website and note paracycling as a sport that they're interested in and would like to compete in, we would normally, normally be in touch with information about the next Talent ID camp coming up. So as a side note, our next one is in Christchurch um, from October the 15th to the 17th. So I'm about to start sending information out about that this coming week. So in paracycling, we have four different types of bikes, uh, tandems for those with visual impairments uh, and they ride with a sighted pilot. Uh, we have single uh, standard two wheel bikes, uh, trikes and hand cycles. So there's a range of different classifications within those types of bikes for 13 classifications in total for men and 13 for women. So our talent ID camps for paracycling used to be standalone events, um, but in recent years, we've run them alongside our open camps, which has worked really well. It gives new riders a, a chance to meet some of our established riders and make connections and help them grow in confidence to take the next step in cycling. So without fail, uh, the heaps of fun. Uh, we always invite and involve families and support crew, and we have a really fun social time um, as well as riding and learning. So at the camps, we usually run a range of workshops introducing the sport of paracycling, uh, what the pathway looks like, as well as other things like nutrition and athlete life workshops. Uh, we also run skill sessions, uh, power testing, and an opportunity to get a national classification with our paracycling classifiers. So following a talent ID camp, there are several different directions that a new rider might go. Um, some riders are selected straight into our high performance athlete development squad which has separate camps and opportunities under the guidance of our paracycling national development coach. Um, and others may be identified as a Paralympic prospect and be invited to camps in the future and then potentially selected into the development squad at a later time. Um, others join our really active group of open community riders and enjoy the range of events on offer throughout the year uh, with their clubs and at a national level and they're invited along to open camps and associated races in a supported environment. So, and many work their way up through the pathway from, from this point also. So the pathway is really different for each individual. Um, for some people, the pathway to the high performance squad, which is the next step on from the development squad, uh, can be really, really fast. So we've got a few riders who are examples of that in our high performance squad at the moment, but for most people, it takes quite a lot longer. So the high performance squad, has several dedicated coaches. Um, they hold specific camps and they're supported to compete internationally um, at selected events. So our paracycling whānau are a fabulous supportive bunch. Uh, we have a lot of support from our high performance athletes. Um, they often come along to talent ID camps and open camps um, and it's a really fun sport to be involved in. So um, I hope to see some of you guys along the way. Hi, my name's Connor Douglas. I'm a young Southland boy from Invercargill. I'm aged 18 and I've been doing paracycling for roughly about two years now, or coming up three. Uh, my impairment to everyone else is my increased tone in my bottom right and my increased weakness in my upper right. Um, uh, the best thing about paracycling, I guess, is just the community in. No one's got any negative effects towards anyone. No beef, I suppose, as we call it these days. Um, so just the community we learn and the support we get from others. Goals for the future, I suppose, are to race at Oceania level or international level, at Worlds, Oceania Champs or possibly Olympic, Paralympic Games. So 
COVID situation dies down a bit, I hope to be in Paris 2024 for the Paralympics. Uh, hi, my name is Jan Edwards. I'm 18. I'm from Christchurch. Uh, I've been paracycling for just under a year now, and uh, my disability is uh, limited. Is my limited function in my left arm. Um, just like getting to race with so many different people and like different like disabilities, and I guess the, the culture around it. It's a lot. It's really friendly. Just to like have fun, but I also want to compete at a high level. So go international. Hopefully, is my main goal. See where it goes. And, Hope you do well. Nice. Hi, I'm Jack McSweeney. Um, cycling under Peter McSweeney is my first name. Um, I got injured playing rugby in 2006. I broke my neck and um, tore the nerves out of my spine at brachial plexus. So that's left me with um, fused spine at C1 and C2 and um, no arm because my brachial plexus doesn't work. Now I cycle in the C5 category and um, my main event is the Kilo, um, being a sprinter and yeah. I've been paracycling for four years, before that I was doing triathlon and due to problems with my good arm um, I had to give up and that's when cycling camp came about in New Plymouth and I got spotted in Talent ID thing for me. Uh, it'd be competing still as an athlete. Um, not I took up coaching and coached a few high profile players now um, but it didn't give me the same enjoyment as competing myself. Goals for the future, uh, hopefully make a World Cup and all going well, get to Paris in 2024. So I'd like to introduce my first guest who's going to take us through the para-sport pathway in their sport. So please welcome Jane Stevens, the Adaptive Snow Sports Manager at Snow Sports New Zealand. So Jane, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you do? Um, thanks, Dale, and hi, everyone. Um, uh, as Dale said, yes, um, I'm Jane, and I work for Snow Sports New Zealand, and I work for you guys as as um, the adaptive manager here. Uh, basically, my role entails pretty much everything adaptive. Um, we're, we're a national sporting organization here and our program has been integrated um, into the Able Body program for um, a, a very long time, actually, nearly, uh, nearly 20 years. Um, so what I do is, is basically right from grassroots is, is helping people get into the sport and work all the way through our, our pathway as such um, with development athletes um, and, and then also our high performance athletes. So big, big scope, um, and, but um, fantastic, fantastic sport to be involved in. Awesome, so what kind of adaptive snow sports and programs do you offer? Um, well, obviously uh, skiing and snowboarding and our ethos is pretty much that um, it uh, doesn't matter what your disability is, um, we can get you skiing or snowboarding. Um, and I absolutely, absolutely um, would say that that is a possibility. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a, a sitting athlete, standing, visually impaired, uh, hearing impaired. It, do, it doesn't matter. Anybody can can do the sport. And that's part of my role, I guess, is, is enabling that. And we do that by... Um, we have programs pretty much set up which are integrated into the able-bodied ski schools or snow sports schools all around New Zealand, um, in particular in the Snow Planet, uh, Whakapapa Tuaroa, um, Mount Hutt in Canterbury, um, and down here in Otago 
in Southland, we have uh, Kadrona Alpine Resort, um, the Ramad Walls and Granite Peak over in Queenstown. So basically what that means is that if you wish to um, have a go and get up to the mountains as you quite simply can contact them and they have all the specialized equipment that's we place equipment into all the uh, mountains. And um, we also have qualified instructors that know what they're talking about when you get up there. So you just like anybody else that wants to get up the mountain, you can go and book in. And we also run um, volunteer programs. So there's volunteer support. So if you need that little bit of extra help up there, there's a free volunteer programs that go alongside that. So, um, and also if you're a member of us here at Snow Sports New Zealand, then we advocate for some pretty um, heavy discounts with the mountains. And, you know, a lot of you might be thinking that it's uh, a sport that's outside your um, um, ability to, to um, afford, but we actually um, advocate with the mountains and the mountains are amazing and they come back and give us um, huge amounts of discounts for lift passes and, and equipment. Awesome. You've answered so many of my questions here. That's fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, it's great. So what about um, competitions? What competitions are there for adaptive snow sports? Um, well, we, we run some um, really fun sort of have a go uh, type things that we um, integrate in so people can be introduced if that's the pathway that they'd like to go down. Um, a lot of the people that we work with are just interested in getting out and um, getting up to the mountains with their friends and family. Um, but if you want to go down the competition uh, route, then, then we run some fun have a go through a few festivals that we run. Um, and we um, work a lot with the power feds around New Zealand to, to help um, get people involved in that. We also have um, national championships that you can be uh, that you can attend, but a lot of it too will actually come with joining in um, with our able-bodied counterparts because there's an absolutely no reason why you cannot join in um, with in, in either ski racing or in some of the snowboard competitions as well with able-bodied athletes, and we do that quite a bit, particularly at school age. We have quite a few people that join in with school age competitions. Awesome. So. Um... One of the questions I've got here is progressing through the stages, like, so what would it take to get through and then up to the high performance level? Um, and our sport with both skiing and snowboarding is actually a very high skill base, as you can imagine, because if anyone's seen any uh, videos of um, any of our uh, high performance athletes, for instance, um, like Adam Hall and Corey Peters, then we're talking, these guys are traveling at quite high speeds. It is a very much an adrenaline sport, you might say. Um, not untowards in some of the competitions where they're getting up to sort of 100 k's an hour while still trying to negotiate mm. their course. So it's very skill-based. So we, we spend a lot of time building skills and, and a lot of that will start um, with you basically getting, getting out and enjoying um, getting onto the mountains and, and learning your craft as such. And then what pretty much happens is uh, we will help you pretty much the whole way through that process of, of through building your skills, through development camps, if that's what you would choose, and then help you to um, get into more of the competition side and then what it takes from there, which is, Within our sport, a lot of it is our guys spend quite a bit of time overseas training and racing overseas. It is perhaps when it becomes high performance, very Eurocentric with Alpine ski racing in particular. And a lot of the competitions and the World Cups uh, are run overseas. So our, our guys do spend a lot of time overseas. Um, but it's pretty school, a cool sport to be involved in, um, traveling around to um, amazing places and um the the mountain environment that we have absolutely i think um snow sports has got so many great role models as well it's really cool to see those guys and get to know those guys along the way um 
So just about co- a little bit about coaches here. So um, I think you talked about how lots of the resorts have got coaches there ready to help. And then from mm-hmm. there, as you move down the pathway, I guess coaches, so you guys deal with the coaching side of stuff too? Yes, we do. Yeah. And um, we have set programs set up with um, uh, snow sports based coaches on, on the mountains. And in particular, our, we run a development program uh, out of uh, Cadrona Alpine Resort, which is in Wanaka or near Wanaka in Queenstown down here. And once you kind of get to that level where we where you've come on the, um, let's say, the high performance uh, radar, you would be invited to come in and join that program. And it operates full time down here during the winter. And we have athletes that are involved in that, that um, that do work um, and we build the program around them. And we have some younger guys too that we can build, build it around um, uh, their schooling or their, their university. So, uh, and then from there, they'll come under our, our national coaches here within Snow Sports New Zealand once they become high performance development and then onto the elite. And then it is pretty much their full-time job as it, as it is with any of the sports. Cool. I'm inspired. I need to come down and give it a go. <laughs> Love um, to have you. <laughs> yeah. So I, he- I hear you've got something really exciting coming up um, later on this year. Yeah, we're doing August on um, from the 6th to the to the 8th of August at the Remarkable Steer. Every year we run a what we call it our festival, and it's basically it's it's for anybody uh, who wants to have a go and anywhere anywhere along the pathway that you fit in. So beginners, so we have lots of people coming that, that might be coming for their first time to, um, to learn and to meet other people with other similar disabilities and learn to ski and snowboard with them. We have our development athletes that come along, our, our um, Paralympics New Zealand athletes come along, um, at, which is Adam Hall and all those guys. We run some fun races, um, we support lessons, and we do some sort of after after school activities as well, if you like, um, do some talks at night, go out for dinners, and, and just a really great chance for um, lots of uh, people to come and um, find out, you know, one, what, what it's about, and two, actually just to connect and have fun with other like-minded people that are that are doing and sometimes pretty crazy stuff yeah. <laughs> um, that uh, yeah it, it's a really really fun three days so um, you know you can contact your local parafids they'll all know about this and or you can quite simply give me a, a an email or a bell down here at snow sports and um, we'll help you sort everything out Thank you, Jane, for the insight into adaptive snow sports. That's really cool. Um, a great, a great little glimpse into into it. Uh, so, I'd like to introduce you all to my second guest now, which is please welcome Michelle O from uh, the Contents in New Zealand. So, Michelle, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you do? Cool. Uh, thanks for having me, Dale. Um, I am the content manager at Badminton New Zealand. Uh, I'm also the national para badminton coach uh, 
which sort of entails everything from grassroots delivery all the way up to um, working with our performance athletes and sort of just building our program and just getting onto court during our training camps. Um, I work really closely with our development manager who oversees our strategy and how we want our whole program to go, um, as well as very closely with our team of coaches, um, Josh, Ken and Marianne, and our associations within the regions. Um, so hopefully you'll see in a little video uh, the difference that Parabadminton is making its debut at the Tokyo Paralympic Games, which is a really exciting time for our badminton community. Um, and also within that video, you'll see that the Parabadminton has six classifications and within that, the athletes have the opportunity to compete in singles, doubles and mixed doubles um, or on various size courts. Um, within New Zealand, our program, which is continuing to grow, has players from across all the different classifications and we work with them across all singles, doubles and mixed doubles. Cool. Awesome. So how many people would play para badminton, do you think? Um, at the moment, we've got one Paralympic hopeful. We probably get about eight to ten development athletes and then 40 to 50 uh, individuals who've probably participated in a para badminton opportunity at some stage. So it is quite small in comparison to some of the bigger sports, um, but definitely one that's growing. Absolutely. And, and quite new, as you say. I mean, that's making its debut um, at the Paralympics later this year. So a really exciting time for badminton. And I'm sure one of the fastest growing para sports actually um, around the world with that, with that new development. Yeah, so, very so, exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how do I get started in para badminton? Um, so I guess the first step as well um, is registering through our Badminton New Zealand website uh, is the first and easiest way to get on our radar. And then what we do from there, it helps us connect you to uh, either a local club or association within your region. And then also for us to connect you with any local opportunities that might be happening, like an open day or training camp um, within the area. Um, from there as well, we like to include people into our training weekends, uh, give them an introduction and get them to meet other players within their classification. And then from there, there's opportunities uh, to compete at some of our national events as well. Awesome. So how would I progress through the stages, do you think? Like, like what does it take to get to high performance in, in para badminton? Um, at the moment, our pathway, it is quite short or quite small. So even as soon as you do get into that first uh, couple of stages, just having a hand in your rack, a, a racket in your hand, um, it is very easy for myself or one of our coaches to see where you are at um, within your sport and also um, identify and help progress you at your region um, and connect you in with some of the coaches that you may be more closer located to. Fabulous. Um, and I think you might've covered the opportunities, um, you know, what para badminton opportunities are there to compete? I think, think you may have already yep. maybe gone over there. Uh, absolutely. But we also are holding our first uh, New Zealand National um, Para Badminton Cup this year. So that's super exciting um, and a huge first step as well for our program. It's awesome. So when, when is that? Um, we're hoping for September, mid-September. Cool. We'll keep our eyes peeled for that for sure. So I think that gives us a really good... Um, overview about para badminton i'm super excited to see it in tokyo later this year and and really looking forward to seeing it grow in new zealand into into one of the bigger para sports so um thanks for all your work michelle and thanks for coming along um so a really massive thank you to jane and michelle for taking the time to talk us through their respective para sport pathways um if you have any more questions or you'd like to get involved please register through the paralympics new zealand um website and you'll be put in contact with the appropriate person. Um, alternatively, just add your questions to the chat function below and we'll endeavour to answer every question. So thank you for joining me. Um, I hope the session's been enjoyable and informative and we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. A flurry of lightning fast hits. Para Badminton.
This is the first time para badminton has officially been included in the Paralympic Games. The rules of para badminton are the same as badminton, with a match consisting of the best of three games up to 21 points. There are two types of event, wheelchair and standing, which are divided into six classes depending on type and severity of impairment. WH1 and WH2 are for wheelchair athletes. SL3 and SL4 are for athletes with a leg impairment. The lower the number in these two groups, the greater the impairment. In SU5, athletes have an arm impairment and SH6 is for athletes with short stature. In the standing events, matches use the entire court, while the wheelchair events use half the court. Doubles uses the entire court apart from close to the net. The standing class features powerful play and speedy matches, making use of the athlete's strong upper bodies. Athletes with short stature cover it with skillful footwork. Athletes in wheelchairs skillfully use the limited space to move their opponent forward and backward. There are as many different styles of play as there are unique and individual athletes. Awesome couple of videos there. Great to see the different sports on offer at the Tokyo Games. I can't wait for Tokyo. And then, of course, that Pathways video. And, Dan, I mean, it's it's nothing to be scared of if you want to aim aim high, is it? Mm, I think uh, it's so good to hear Dale and, and Jane and Michelle talk that you can see straight away that there's really good people in place. If you're just getting started, it's not this thrown in the deep end. There are people and processes in place to get you from where to go. And I think the cool thing also to note is, is not everyone wants to be at the elite level. Some people just want to get into it. They may want to be recreational. They may want to, to be competing in New Zealand. So there's this sort of pathways for everyone. And the easiest first step is just jump on the PNZ website and register and someone will be in touch. And while you're there, register for tomorrow because we're here again tomorrow and you want to come back and visit us because we've got heaps more cool things to see, heaps more great people to talk to. Um, and another quick reminder I've got for you is to ask questions throughout the session. We will receive all your questions through the Q&A function, which is underneath the screen. You can scan the QR code below the screen with your phone. It will take you straight to the Q&A function. I know we all know about Q QR codes these days. Alternative, you, uh, alternatively, you can visit the link, which is app.sli.do, and enter the code hashtag Parasport. There's a slight delay between you sending your questions and us receiving them. So if you have a burning question, don't leave it to the end. Just send it as it comes through on your way to making a cup of tea as you stay with us for what is going to be a great rest of tonight and tomorrow as well. So next session coming up, there may well be a bunch of questions. It is classification. It's one of those things that I find it's very much an integral and intriguing part of Parasport. And it's kind of the, the explanation for when people turn their head on the sides and say, how does that person compete against that person? How does that work? So classification is about how people compete against other people with a similar level of function. So uh, the good thing is we have some really good people to take us through that, how it works, uh, how to get classified. Uh, but just to kick things off, we've got a pretty cool video. Classification is crucial to para sport. Without it, competitive sport is not possible or meaningful. It establishes who can and cannot compete and groups athletes into sport classes. Disabled people who are not eligible to compete at the Paralympic Games can continue to enjoy sport, but they are not on a Paralympic journey. The classification system of each sport is different, but its aim is always the same, to minimize the impact of someone's impairment on the outcome of competition. Classification might seem complicated, but so are people. No two para-athletes are completely identical. Athletes may look different to their competitors, as there is a spectrum of impairments in each class. To be classified, athletes must submit medical information, go through sport and impairment-specific tests, and they may be observed in competition. During the classification process, athletes must give their best effort and a true reflection of their impairment. Athletes can choose someone to accompany them during this process. To enter a national competition, the athlete must go through national classification run by the sport's national governing body. 
This should mirror international classification as much as possible. To enter an international competition, the athlete must undergo international classification, run by the Sports International Federation. This outcome always overrules national classification. Classifiers work in panels of at least two and make decisions together. They decide which class an athlete competes in. They are trained by the International Federation of that sport and must have relevant professional qualifications. For example, they could be a physiotherapist or an ophthalmologist. Intentional misrepresentation, where someone fakes their level of impairment, is cheating. If it's proven, athletes or staff can face a maximum four-year ban. Comparing competition results, personal bests or season bests on its own is not evidence that an athlete has been misrepresenting their impairment. An athlete may change class for a number of reasons during their career. This does not mean that they were misrepresenting their impairment before they changed class. Depending on the nature of their impairment, an athlete could be classified multiple times during their career. An international federation can put an athlete through the classification process again if it thinks the athlete may have been given an incorrect class. Athletes may need to go through the classification process again when there are changes made to the sport's classification rules. Classification isn't the key to success in para-sport. Different factors that impact on performance include talent, training technique and good coaching. Athletes have successfully won gold medals despite being considered amongst the most impaired in their class. For further information, please visit our classification page at paralympics.org.nz. So a brilliant video, video there just to give us a bit of a taste of it. We've got the real pros here live in the audience. So with us here uh, is Ruth and Margaret, and I'll let them introduce themselves. We were going to have Cameron Leslie, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. Cameron's uh, one of our phenomenal New Zealand para athletes. But, uh, but the floor is yours. Tell us uh, a bit about yourselves and maybe just how did you get into classification? Oh, thank you. Thanks for the opening um, and the introduction. Uh, I've been the classification manager with Paralympics New Zealand for probably about 12 years now. So I come from an occupational therapy background, but prior to that I uh, have been working in disability sport for probably the last 20, 20 odd years. Um, a bit by default really, uh, it was somebody said to me, a former manager, how would you like to get involved in classification? I said, I don't know anything about classification. Well, you've got therapy, you've got profession behind you that um, could get you involved and it evolved from there. So. I've had the opportunity to classify over quite a number of sports and fortunately I've had opportunities to travel internationally with that as well. So, um, Brilliant. And what about you, Ruth? Yeah. Um, so my name's Ruth. I'm a swimming classifier um, nationally and internationally and my background's in physiotherapy and I started classifying um, oh, 17, 18 years ago now but I actually started when I did Duke of Edinburgh scheme as a high school student one of my volunteer roles was teaching kids with disabilities how to swim so that's cool where I started so i think there. a couple of really cool things pulling out there obviously you're both really you're professionals in your field and that really come came through in that video that you need that background uh, but also just the the extras that come similar to being an athlete it's traveling the world and the unique opportunities that get to come with being a classifier are pretty cool so i guess we're talking not just to athletes but to potential future classifiers out there um, but before we delve too deep into that sort of stuff just very simple the elevator pitch what is classification mm -hmm. Ruth's going to explain that. So, um, so as we've seen on the video, so classification is the system that we put in place to provide some structure for para sports, and this is so that athletes compete on that fair and level playing field. So athletes are grouped into classes, um, basically, so which race that they're allowed to compete in, and that's dependent on the impact that their impairment has on them when they're competing in that sport. And each sport has got individual rules that govern how we decide or how we give the classification for that particular sport. Mm. So if I, I'm just getting started in Paralympic sport, and maybe Margaret, you wanna, wanna answer this one, is should I just straight off the bat get classified? 
Well, everybody with a disability has opportunities to be involved in sport and recreation, particularly in New Zealand. We're very lucky. Um, so for general participation, no, a classification isn't necessary. But when an athlete wants to um, start to participate and compete more in a, in a para sport against other athletes with a disability, then it's advisable to seek a classification because that will first of all identify whether they're actually eligible to compete in that sport and we'll put them in a sports class with other athletes with similar uh, limitations to actually carrying out the skills of the sport. Brilliant. And um, I guess what I've found interesting over the years is often athletes will come through, and, and, and I guess Lisa Adams is one who's a phenomenal athlete, but she was basically scouted by Raylene Bates, who saw someone who could be a para-athlete. She was competed, competing in able-bodied sports. So um, I guess my question is, how do I even know if I'm eligible for para sport? Um, so, to be eligible for Paris um, for competition as a para athlete, you need to meet two criteria. So, the first thing you need to um, have one of ten impairments. So, ten eligible impairments um, that are set by the International Paralympic Committee that are the impairments that mean you can compete in para sport. So those are intellectual disability, visual disability, and then the physical impairments, which are hypotonia, ataxia, athetosis, limb length deficiency, loss of range of motion, loss of muscle strength, short stature. Um, so you need to have one of those impairments to, as a as a baseline. And before you come to classification, you need to provide some medical information to back up um, just your medical history around those impairments. Um, but that's you also need to have a minimum impairment level. So each sport sets this differently. And so that is um, a sort of a criteria that you need to meet a certain amount of disability so that you're disabled enough to compete in that sport. And that doesn't if you don't meet the minimum impairment, it doesn't mean you don't have a disability. It just means that you don't meet the criteria for that particular sport. Mm. So what about with different disabilities? So often um, I think where people find it confusing is if you have someone with a different disability. And how do you explain that that's sort of about the function? that's involved. Marguerite, what do you, okay. what do you well, say to people Well, classification that? systems are based on, um, or classification itself is based on the functional abilities of the athlete, and it's not so much on the medical diagnosis of the athlete. So um, in many sports classes, you'll have athletes with dis different disabilities competing. Um, their disabilities may be different, but the limitations they have in actually carrying out the skills of the sport will be very similar, and that's what the process of classification identifies. So you kind of you're trying to create a level playing field in terms of yep. people so that competing with fair similar functions, disability, yep. regardless of the disability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you're minimising the impact impairment has on their abilities to carry out um, the skills of the sport. Nice. So um, I've turned up. I love the sport. I'm into it. How do I go about applying for being classified? Well, probably the first thing um, to apply for classification is to get in touch with the classification manager, which is me, in the first instance. And there's, there's um, opportunities within the sport to do that. But And the contact details are on the website. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then um, I guess another big question is, is it just one and done? So Ruth, like if you've classified Cameron Leslie, he's that's it from a 13-year-old, he's good all the way through? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so once you've gone undergone classification, you get a sports class but also a sports class status. So your sport class tells you which race you're in, which, which level you're competing at, but your sports class status is also really important and that tells you when you might need to be classified again. So often athletes might have a review with a year attached to it and that means that at some point in that year they need to go and be classified again. So the types of reasons you might need to be classified more than once are your age, so whether you've meet, reached maturity, um, if you've got a deteriorating or a fluctuating condition, if your condition has changed, um, or if the rules for the sport change. Right. And what about, I think, you know, we're talking a lot about looking at people's disability, their muscle function. I think for some people that might be quite intimidating. Can they have a support person? Can other people come with them when they go through this process? 
They can. Every athlete is entitled to have one support person um, accompanying them to classification. Uh, for young athletes under the age of 18, it's essential that they're accompanied by an adult um, and they sign for them on their behalf on, on the consent form. Um, sometimes at international competitions, for example, there might be interpreters involved, but at a national level, um, yes, each athlete is permitted to have a support person with them. Mm. Um, but the, the questions are always directed to the athlete, but sometimes a support person may be required to help fill in some, some details. Mm. And you're not too scary either, so it's not no. too, <laughs> nothing to be worried about. It's it? really important at the start of a classification session to put the athlete at ease, explain what you're going to do so they fully understand the process. Yeah, it's nice. really, really important developing that rapport at the beginning. And having gone through it many times, uh, I've found there is that. There's, the interaction is what makes it interesting and, and being able to communicate. And I find that as classifiers, you always take that mm -hmm. on board and you, mm -hmm. you spend the time, which is brilliant. With um, the next question, I guess, is and for me, you know, I have been in different sports. Talk to us about, and Marguerite, you said you cover a lot of sports. So do I... I get classified five, four different sports. How does that work? So I can't just be wheelchair rugby and be the same classification for throwing or no. track? No, not at all. Every sport, every para sport, has a separate classification system, and that's um, developed by the International Federation for that sport. Um, so it's, yeah, every, every sport you want to be involved in, you'll, you'll need a, a new classification because the activities of the sport are different and an athlete's um, impairment will impact that sport to a certain, to a different extent. Mm. Um, so for example, if an athlete um, was in, had an amputation through the wrist, for example, the impact of not having a hand in swimming would be way greater than um, uh, running 800 metres, for example. The impact would be a lot more. A lot more. So it, it's really important, um, it, well, it's essential to be classified for very sport specific very very sport specific and um, each classification system now is being based more and more on scientific evidence so um, very objective measures. I think that's important to take into account as well it's not just you know you sit there and you, you measure a limb or you test a muscle it is about sports specificity and mm. um, so when you it's wheelchair rugby you've got the person in the chair when they're on the track you've got their limb on you really go through a full range from bench test mm. to Mm. in the sport right mm. Mm. and we'll see that shortly in, in a video we're going to show but for some athletes um, um, they may be eligible in one sport and not another mm. it's not because they don't have an impairment but the impairment for that sport may not be severe enough mm. Mm, to be eligible for that sport right so when i've gone through all the classification proce process um, do i need to prove that when i rock up to a competition no, you don't. Um, if, the if the athlete's been classified before, all the classification details will be st stored um, and protected on the sports data management system. And so any event organiser um, will have access to the master list of classifications for athletes in that sport. So the athlete does not necessarily have to have a card or a certificate or a piece of paper to say, this is, this is my, um, my class. Mm. No. Cool. So the next one is where I guess classifiers can be seen as the baddies, um, and I guess it, sometimes you have to <laughs> we have to deliver tough news. Someone's really yeah. passionate about a sport, but they're not eligible, and then mm. ultimately they have too much function. So I guess um, what does that mean if you if someone's told that they're not eligible for for a sport, and what are their pathways from there? Um, so. If you have an eligible impairment, but then you're considered not eligible after the evaluation, it means that you haven't met the minimum impairment criteria for that sport. And that's really tough for an athlete to take. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a disability. It just means that your disability doesn't qualify you to be a para-athlete in that sport. So you have the right to be reviewed, um, again, by a panel, but and that second decision is, is final. Um, so if you're in, ineligible, it doesn't mean you can't enjoy your sport, doesn't mean you can't participate, but it does mean that you can't be a comp um, compete as a para-athlete in mm. that sport. And I think the positive, the flip side to that is while that person may be ineligible, it's because we're making it fair for those that do mm. have less function. Or, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. 
What about um, the actual process? Like how long does it take from someone turning up and saying, hi, my name is and I want to play this sport through mm. to saying this is your classification? So that varies hugely depending on the sport. So it can be as short as 30 minutes or it could be as long as an hour and a half, say, for s in my sport swimming. Okay. And um, I guess I've run out of all the pre-prepared questions from my end, so it's time to go to the boards. So just straight off the top there, at what point does it become necessary to have a classification to continue participating slash competing in para sport? Does this differ from sport to sport? Who wants to I think we've probably one? answered that yeah. um, in, in the fact that every sport does have a different classification system. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's probably, um, is it maybe we're saying that we can give a provisional classification? So if you're just starting out, you can enjoy, you can join a club, compete in your sport with able-bodied um, athletes. But then, so for a swimming, for example, I'm assuming other sports, so we can give a provisional classification, so that's just a paper-based assessment, so you can get an idea of where you're going to sit, and that can be quite a good opportunity for a young sort of a young athlete, someone who doesn't know how competitive they want to be, but want to sort of give it a, give it a try. Mm. There's a few questions coming through around, I guess, various different disabilities, for example. Is there any athletes that you know of with essential tremor? Uh, does the classification process consider athletes' neurofatigue in regards to head injuries? What's, uh, I mean, it's the short answer would be you cover the spectrum, but how mm. do you... Um, well, particularly around the run with essential tremor, I mean, ataxia is um, a, a form of, of, of tremor, uncontrolled movements, and it depends on what, what causes that tremor and whether it meets the eligible impairment uh, with that's dictated by the IPC, mm. International Paralympic Committee. So it's important to get really good medical information and we need to collect that, a, mm. a doctor's declaration um, of the medical condition and um, whether it meets one of the eligible impairment types. But that's the first thing that we need to mm. identify. I think there may be a little bit of a perception that... Um you know, it's more about, or it could be that people just see people in wheelchairs or people with limb deficiency. But again, you know, I think they shouldn't see it as a barrier to get into sport. Like if you have a disability, if you think there's an opportunity, you should just have a have a go, start a conversation, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think some, some of the things that with some of the individual um, disability type questions or individual conditions, the best thing is just to start a conversation um, with someone like Marguerite um, and start that process of classification, bringing your medical information together so that we can really talk it through. Mm. And um, yeah, a classification is done on an individual ba basis um, as each ath athlete comes into the classification room. So. Mm. Um, but I think it's important to note as well, like they will, you you will talk them through it, right? It's as simple yeah. as in the first yeah. instance, a phone call, an email, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, and prior to a classification session, I will always send out some preliminary information of, of what to expect. This is how, what the process is going to be. This is how long it may, may take so that they, there is a general idea of um, the classification process. Mm. Mm. This is an interesting one to clear up. Can the classification be used when competing in able-bodied sports? I guess that alludes to someone has a disability, do they, does that become a factor when they want to be involved with their peers in able-bodied sport? Is there any crossover? Well, classification is essential if you're competing in a para sport. Um, anybody with a classification can compete in able-bodied sport. There's, there's nothing stopping an athlete doing that. It's just they won't be able to compete under that class. Unless it's a a uh, participatory event where you might have people that aren't classified with classified, but um, if, if it is a competitive para sport event, um, mm -hmm. classification is essential, but not for an able bodied event. Mm. Mm. This is one we may have touched on already, but I think again it's worth really clarifying. Do you need to be classified if you want to get involved just at community level in para sport? Because this is about, you know, essentially about getting into participation. Para sport. No. Someone turns up, you talk about provisional classes, again, just maybe just mm. reiterate some of those ways that people can, can just get in when they're coming in cold. Yeah. So I, th I think there's nothing stopping um, athletes with disabilities joining their local club. And in fact, that's what we want athletes to do if they can. And, um, you know, Paralympics New Zealand, I think, have got lots of um, staff and people that can actually help clubs sort of integrate 
kids with disabilities into sport and you know make that pathway a little bit smoother and a little bit easier so there's nothing stopping that part of the process classification really comes into when you start want to want to start competing in para sport mm -hmm. um, and start moving a little bit more into that specific disability sport and looking at competition and having that competitive enjoy you know the enjoyment of the competitive aspect of sport mm. yeah cool I guess a curly question is some of the things that are, how do you classify some of the things that are less tangible? So we've talked about limb deficiency, spinal cord injury is maybe a little bit more straightforward, but there's a question here about, does the classification process consider athlete neuro fatigue? Yeah. You might want to answer yeah. that. Yeah, right? so. Being a medical classifier. Yeah, yeah. so. No, it's probably the, not, not really. So I guess it's one of those things we know it exists, but there are certain things that aren't taken into consideration. So things like, um, you know, we look at restricted range of motion, but actually sometimes hypermobility causes problems as well. And unfortunately things like hypermobility is not, um, a, it's not an eligible impairment. And in a similar way, fatigue is like that as well. It's very hard to quantify and take into, you know, you can't really measure fatigue and it actually doesn't come into the eligible impairments. For similar sport. to pain. Pain is, mm. pain is um, yeah. Um, it can be um, quite restrictive of movement, but pain can't be measured. So it is not um, an impairment type that is accepted. Um, within the Paralympic movement. And I think that probably comes back to trying to create that level f playing field, fairness for all. You've got a, yeah. you've got a fairly prescriptive mm. book that you're working yeah. from. Mm. Yeah. So we've, we have to set the boundary somewhere. And, you know, it's, and I think we're all 100% aware that there are things that affect athletes that fall outside of the rules. You know, an athlete can have eligible impairments and ineligible impairments and that's unfortunately we can only take into consideration the eligible impairments mm. because that's the rules of our sport. So we've talked a lot about um, athletes and how to get into sport. Tell us about some of the, what are some of the best things about being a classifier? Obviously when we're not in the COVID era, <laughs> you get to do a bit of travelling. Oh, I um, think making a difference to people's lives through sport because it's enabling them to be involved in sport with others with similar limitations and um, particularly at a grassroots level and seeing those athletes develop going from a national classification and getting into the international scene and and um, and um, competing at the top level it, it's really rewarding but it's also personally as well you know you meet amazing people um, we're both really fortunate we are international classifiers now we've gone through the process of training and you make wonderful friends all around the world, but um, it, it's it's really rewarding to to see development in athletes that um, and the difference it makes in their lives through sport. Straight away, you can see your mm. face light up. Like obviously, it's it's passion that, that mm. you love. What about you, yeah. Ruth? What are some of the um, highlights? Uh, well, I think um, you know just seeing athletes with disabilities compete at a really elite level and just. Um, it's really quite awe-inspiring and you know I, th I think especially some of the low classes that these are athletes who have quite significant disabilities and just watching them just nail a sport is actually just really exciting at, um, at an international level and I think from a national level I think you know not every athlete that you're going to assess is going to um, become a Paralympian and that's just um, that's just the reality it's not every able-bodied kid is going to become an Olympian it's um, you know it's quite a rare achievement but you actually watch these kids and sometimes the first time you've seen them they're 12 and then we see them every couple of years and it's actually amazing when you see you know you're seeing 18 20 year olds and just watching them develop over that time and grow in their sport and just grow up as people and it's really quite um, yeah, it's neat to, we follow their progress at a distance and just people achieving their potential is amazing and sport's a great way to do it. Nice. And I think you really do see that playing out in life, right? As uh, people become more involved in sport, other factors and parts of their lives mm. become more fuller. Yes. Sort of, mm. and, and I've seen that through wheelchair rugby is people will come along and they may have 
the first thing we do is a bit of peer pressure. We get rid of the push handles and the anti tips yeah. off their wheelchair, mm -hmm. and they just independence grows yeah. from that. Yeah, and it's neat to see people thrive, mm. um, you know, and people doing well, and mm. yeah, that's what we're all about. Coming off the back of some of those good experiences, there is a question here: How do we become? How does one become a classifier? Register your interest with Paralympics New Zealand. Um, there's medical classifiers and there's technical classifiers, so there's specific requirements in each of um, each of those areas. Um, so um, on on the Paralympics New Zealand website, there is a form that can be filled in and completed in, in the sports that the um, potential classifier is interested in. Um, we're a bit restricted at the moment with our national and international training because of COVID. Uh, a lot of classification courses are now being run online. Um, obviously don't have the same practical component, uh, but um, yeah, each international federation generally does have a national classifiers training course. Mm. Otherwise, um, we have on occasion trained internally with our own, using our own experts here with um, training classifiers within New Zealand. Cool. That mm. important thing we just keep coming back to is all the info is there on the PNZ site. Mm. People just, mm. you just get the ball rolling with an email and it mm. kicks mm. off from there. You've talked about this already, how long does a classification take? But I think it might be worth just breaking it down even further. What does it look like? Um, and we've talked about the support people in there, but say swimming, um, you've got a swimmer rocking up. What are the, you know, at a high level, what are the big aspects, the big chunks that you take yeah. through? Yeah, I mean, so as I can talk for swimming because it's a good example. So um, the first thing you need to do is you, you consent to the to coming for a classification and you, um, so you know, you sign a consent form that you're going to do your best and um, that sort of thing. And then you come in and we'll ask you a few questions. We've actually got a video that covers this soon, so I'll go really. Mm. We ask you a few questions. Um, then we'll do a physical assessment and that will just be determined based on your medical information you've provided. And then we do a technical assessment. So in the pool for swimming, we'll, we'll look at that swimming. And... Um, some t depending on the sport or the situation, we may want to watch you in a competition and just see how you perform under pressure. Cool. And I think that is a really good lead in um, for the video. So mm -hmm. we can probably lead into that now. But also remember there's there's more time for questions after the videos. But uh, with without further ado, let's take a look at the video. Hi, I'm Cameron Leslie. I'm a Paralympic swimmer and my classification is S4, SB4 and SM4. I've been to three Paralympic Games and won three Paralympic gold medals. I started swimming when I was 10 years old. I had my first classification at 11, um, and my most recent classification was in 2019 in the lead up to the Tokyo Paralympic Games. Hi, I'm Ruth McLaren, Senior Medical Classifier. I come from a physiotherapy background. My disability is called dysmalia, um, which means that my limbs didn't form um, fully. So I've got that alongside of uh, a loss of muscle power and a loss of range of movement as well. For some, classification can seem complicated, but the purpose of today is to demystify and ease any anxiety along the way around the classification process. Ruth will go through the process of a para-swimming classification using me as a model, and we will pretend that we're going through a full classification. Classification is an essential component for all para-sport because it defines who can compete. It groups athletes into sport classes with other athletes with similar activity levels and makes sure competition is fair and ensures that athlete success is determined by their skill and not how severe their impairment is. An athlete with a disability requires a classification before they can compete as a para-athlete in a para-sport. The classification process differs from sport to sport because classification is designed to be specific to the different movements in each sport. Classification may seem a bit complicated, but there are set rules that classifiers need to follow so that classifications are fair and accurate for all athletes. Classifiers have the welfare, safety and fairness of para-athletes front of mind during classification so that competition can be fair for all. Before attending classification, I need my doctor to fill out a form to explain my disability and any challenges and limitations that I might have so that the classifiers know about my, me and my disability before the day. On the day, I have to fill out a consent form to say I'll give my best effort and give an honest response to all of everything that they're asking me to do. But the classifiers will make me feel welcome and let me ask any questions at any time. 
Classifiers are experts in their field and are trained by the International Federation, in my case, World Para Swimming. I'm a medical classifier and I work with a technical classifier who could be a sports specialist such as a coach or sports scientist. There is always a panel of two classifiers. Today it's just me, but I'll give an outline of what both classifiers will do in a medical and a technical assessment with CAM. The first part of the assessment involves a few questions of the athletes, including their sporting history and length of time in their sport, current training, recent events they've competed in, and other sports training they may do. If I need any more details about the athlete's impairment and how this affects them during their sport, I will ask at this time so I can get a full picture of the athlete's abilities and which assessments are going to be appropriate for them. The next component involves a medical assessment to measure the athlete's impairment. Because CAM's impairments are loss of muscle power, range of motion and shortened limbs, I'll use a number of different assessments. Each assessment is scored and contributes to the final calculation that determines the sport class. OK Cam, so the first assessment I'm going to do is measuring limb length. So for the purposes of this video I'm just going to measure one limb, but in classification we would be measuring any limb that has an impairment. Okay, Cam, now I'm going to look at your muscle power. Can you reach your arm up to the ceiling? Great. And bring it back down. Fabulous. And then bring it halfway. Great. And hold really strong. Great. Good job. Okay, now can I get you to lie in on your tummy with your head through the whole thing? Thanks. Okay, good work. And can you lift your arm up off the bed? Great. Well done. And hold strong. Great, good job. And now we're going to measure the range of motion of the joints that are restricted. Great, can you bend your elbow up as far as you can? Thank you. Great, and can you straighten it as far as you can? Perfect, thanks Kim. Following the medical assessment, we move into what's called the technical assessment. So Ruth will watch me in the water, make sure I'm safe, and see what challenges I have with floating, rotating, and gliding in the water. She'll also watch me in all four strokes, as well as how I go about doing a start and a turn. Now that we're done with the medical assessment, it's time to head off to the pool for the technical assessment. See you soon. Once the medical and technical assessments are done, the scores are added up and a sports class is allocated. The swimmer may be observed in their first swimming event in the competition. The outcome, after the medical and a technical, may stay the same or may change. The athlete will be given a final sports class and sports star class status of either a review status, that is, they need to be seen again, or a confirmed status not classified again unless there's a change in their condition. Young athletes who are still developing in their sport or athletes who have fluctuating conditions will always receive a review status. We hope this video has given you a better understanding of what classification is, why it's an important step in becoming a para-athlete and what's involved in the process. The principles of classification assessment are similar across sports, they're just done differently depending on the sport. We hope this video has given you a clearer picture of what's involved in classification and the types of questions and movements the classifiers will ask of you so that you can be given a sports class for competition. Classifiers work courteously, respectfully and always have the athlete at the centre of all that they do. They will always ensure that the most accurate class is given to each athlete so that all competition can be fair and the athlete who is trained the best will succeed, irrespective of their disability.
So a big thank you to Ruth and Marguerite. So hopefully they've debunked a few of the myths and, and helped to clarify what classification is all about. As of... Um, as I said, I think for me, I always find it it's a very intriguing part of Paralympic sport. It's what people talk about around the lunch table. It's, you know, different people's classifications, where they landed and all that sort of stuff. And so it's very much an integral part of the sport. But it's also something that's not to be afraid of. And as with getting into sport, the easiest thing is just to go to the website, kick off a conversation and take it from there. There's good people to take you through the process, as well as pretty much everything we talked about today is covered in the FAQs on the site. So I think that's pretty much us for the night. Yeah, I've popped back in here just to, just to say good night to you all because we've had such a great time. It has been truly just such an awesome, entertaining, interesting um, evening. A great way to kick off the very first Get Started in Paris Sport online event. I've loved being here with you. I've had a couple of cups of tea. I hope you've done the same and you've soaked it all in. If you've seen something or heard something that you've liked and you've thought, I need to tell Aunt Marge or someone else that they need to watch, we are coming back tomorrow. So you want to make sure that you join us and go and register at the uh, at the website. Yeah, it's disappeared really quickly tonight, but tomorrow we've got another couple of hours starting earlier from 2 to 4, and we have some really cool people joining us, a bunch of athletes. We have a sports psychologist, so that is a big passion of mine. love the sports psychologist. They made a big difference to me as an athlete, but also just as a person. Uh, so Rod Corbin's joining us there, and we have a functional adaptive movement coach. So it's going to be interesting times. It definitely will. Make sure you join us 2 o'clock tomorrow. We will see you then.